to Data and Society. My name is Rebecca Wexler. I'm a former fellow here and a current affiliate. I work on data technology and criminal justice issues. And it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you here for the final night of three Wednesdays, where we're featuring this year's uh, cohort of fellows to talk about their work. Next up, our final speaker is Jasmine McNeely with a talk titled Crypto Party as Rent Party. Jasmine is currently an assistant professor of telecommunication at the University of Florida College of Journalism and Communications, a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, a fellow at the Stanford University Digital Civil Society Lab, Chair of the Communication Law and Policy Division of the International Communication Association, and recently completed a six-month term as a visiting researcher with Spotify Research, working with the Algorithmic Bias Squad. She studies information, communication, and technology with a view toward influencing law and policy. Her research focuses on privacy, on online media, communications, and culture. So help me welcome Jasmine, please. So good afternoon. Uh, so it's not lost on me that today is Juneteenth. So happy Juneteenth, you all. Um, if you don't know what Juneteenth is, uh, June the 19th, 1865, the last people to find out that they were free, so slaves in Galveston Bay, Texas, found out the US Army had to trot into town and tell them that they were free. And so what I submit to you is that we have there a demonstration of a failure, right? A failure of information, or access to information, access to data. Because slaves had to rely on their masters who, at best, were apathetic to their plight, at worst, were, had their worst interests at heart, right? To tell them that they no longer were in bondage. So we have a failure there, right? So what I want to talk about today are failures, but how communities are picking up the slack where there is a failure. Failure of government, failure of civil society agencies. So what I'm interested is in information, particularly the disposition of information as it relates to technology, emerging technology and media. What I want to know is how people and organizations actually behave so that when there is law, when there is policy to influence, we actually know how people behave and the influence of law and policy and technology on people, but also how people influence technology. So my talk today is Crypto Party as Rent Party with the subtitle Community as Technology and Peace to Rigo for that, that subhead right there. So I think it's important to think about community as technology. What is technology? But technology is just a set of processes, a, a process that we go through to create something. We think of technology only in terms, I think, as the digital technology. So this Mac right here or this uh, TV, these screens. But technology is more than that. It's broader than that. And I think that's really important when we think about it, particularly when we think about critically about what technology is and why the rent party. So how do I get to this research in the first place? Um, one of my favorite and foundational pieces was written by an urbanist slash sociologist slash anthropologist, Abdul Malik Simon. And um, this is a quote from it. It's a, it's a paper called People as Infrastructure, uh, Intersecting Fragments in Johannesburg. And so what Simone did was he went to Joburg. He went to Joburg and he studied. He did some participant observation, interviews, what was happening in uh, way back in 2004, uh, what was happening in Johannesburg, South Africa. So. Uh, Open, if you read the opening abstract, he talks about Joburg being as far away from the stereotypical, what we think of as an African village with huts and, and those kinds of things. It's a, it's a cosmopolitan place. But at the same time, post-apartheid, you had the kind of ruins of urbanization. You had uh, white populations who had moved out of certain areas, and you had governments who were failing to provide the things that people need to help run a city or help make a city work and help make all the people in a city 
uh, be able to function. But what you had instead was infrastructure that popped up to make the city run. And so this is a quote that I find fascinating from that piece. And he says, a platform for providing and reproducing life in the city. In other words, a specific economy of perception and collaborative practice is constituted through the capacity of individual actors to circulate across and become familiar with a broad range of spatial, residential, economic, and transactional positions. So where people have found that government fails, where civil society fails, um, we think of infrastructure only in the physical, but there is a social infrastructure that undergirds all of this and that can step in or does step in, has to step in, for things to run for the people in the cities. Now, I know I'm talking about city a lot and urban spaces, and there's a reason for that, but I think this also uh, applies to the suburban or the exurban or the rural as well. There are social networks. There is social infrastructure that props up life in these areas to make it function for the people who live there. Otherwise, it would not do so. And so when I think of people as infrastructure, again, I think of, and this, this graph is gonna change your life. Yeah. When I think of, <laughs> we think of bridges, we think of the physical, right? Um, but where there's a failure of the physical, I have a hole in the bridge, right? So people have stepped in. People fill in the gap, right? And, and this is gonna be important. So a failure in Joburg was that when white people moved, you had a lack of, uh, um, of Chain stores, grocery stores would leave, right? So you'd have places where people wouldn't be able to get groceries. So you have markets popping up, right? So that's the people as infrastructure, people seeing a need and filling in because of failures. Um, and I submit to you that we have some failures, right, that are happening right now, then we'll talk about it in a second. But the project I'm looking at is related to not just this city, but related to across the United States and a little bit of Canada as well. And how, as technology has emerged and been deployed by not just city governments, but corporations and other organizations as well, how their failures with technology, or at least how our approaches to technology, and how that implicates um, surveillance. It not just implicates surveillance, it is surveillance, right? These technologies have disparate impacts on particular marginalized groups. I'm thinking of black folks and Latinx people and queer people and religious minorities and uh, a lot of other groups that traditionally have been marginalized, but the impact on these groups is disparate in comparison to what we think of as mainstream. And I submit to you like from this research, that I've been doing that what is happening now is the emergence of uh, community infrastructure, or I would say re-emergence of community infrastructure that is filling in the gaps where these failures are happening. And so I analogize it to the rent party. So we're in New York City. If we take the, the R, the W, um, beyond like the construction happening and some of the other subways, we can go up to Uptown and we can go to Harlem. And Harlem is a storied place. It is a place that you can read about, you can talk about the Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes and all of these other great people. But Harlem is a product uh, and, and benefited from um, a movement of people from south to north. Uh, so both social and economic refugees, quite frankly, um, from very real issues that were happening. Um, and so you have this abundance of people who were going north, not just to Harlem, but Chicago and Detroit and Cleveland and California. Uh, and they moved into these spaces because the north was promised to them as a place with a whole lot of economic opportunity. But when they got there, the same old oppressive forces were at work, right? So the north was not utopia. And so people were living in these conditions where it costs a lot. So the rent is high now, the rent was high back then as well. And so to sustain themselves, people would come together, communities would come together and they would throw parties, a rent party, 
right? Which is exactly as it is. How are you gonna pay your rent? You throw a party, people pay a cover, you drink, you eat, you listen to music, you Lindy hop, you dance, right? And then you go to church the next day <laughs> as if nothing happened. So this is a painting, you've probably seen it before. It is Mabel Dwight's uh, 1929 painting of Harlem Rent Party. And so people would go to these parties. But if you look at what a rent party had, there are a couple of keys that I wanna talk about that are important. So number one key was that it was hyper-local, right? So I'm talking specifically about Harlem, but other places as well. You don't have a rent party just any old place. You need to bring people to the spot where uh, people need to pay their rent. Um, it was a house or somebody's house, and you wanted people to come to that particular location, hyperlocality. There was a value exchange. So to dance the night away, to eat, to drink, you needed to pony up some money. Right, so there is value exchange and that's important. And there were goals, community and sustainability. So we wanted to keep the people that we knew in their house. We wanted to sustain the community that we were building. We had already left the community down south. We wanted to keep them in the community up north. And then virality, right? So virality meaning we want a whole lot of people to come, come out and support. But also, you should know that rent parties weren't just parties for um, making rent, that some musicians that we know well became famous from playing at rent parties. We're thinking of Duke, Duke Ellington. These are people who became famous playing at the rent parties. And so these factors are really important because you see these same factors with today's technology. So the project I did this year and continuing to do is a look at the emergence slash reemergence of community groups and people whose tasks, whose mission it is to educate their communities about the very real dangers of surveillance technologies, both corporate and kind of civic uh, related technologies. And so what they'll do is they'll put on things like crypto parties. They'll put on things like uh, uh, kind of Skillshare, how to use your, te your technology safety, how to use your phone safely, how to uh, use the Onion browser, right, the Tor, and how to think about what's happening. And then they'll also go to the city council meeting and say, you know what, we think that you all shouldn't be allowed to use ShotSpotter. We think that, you know, the government shouldn't be using facial technology. So if you've been paying attention to what happened in San Francisco recently, the result of the ban was because of community groups working really hard over a number of years saying, you know what, we can't have this in our community. So these are the functions of these groups. And what I've been able to do is interview um, members of these groups and people who are doing these crypto parties themselves and to see why they are participating. I'm gonna skip this, but note that all four of those things apply. But I wanna leave you with a quote from an actual interview I did. And they say, so many people I know constantly feel surveilled, constantly feel the shame and paranoia, are dealing with PTSD. I'm not trying to add to that. I actually really want to live in a world of trust. The reason that they give for participating, for holding these skill shares, for teaching people how to safely use their, their technology is because they want to change uh, the community. They want to be able to give to their friends, to give to these people a sense of trust in the world, to be able to, to live in a world f more free than they were. And as we related back to Juneteenth and to the rent party, we think about freedom, freedom from surveillance, but also freedom to just live without the weight of being watched, the weight of always being surveilled or always thought of in a negative light. And I think that's an important thing. So how am I doing this in the future? I'm continuing to um, interview people and to watch and to participate in these parties um, for continuing research. Thank you.
you so much to all three of our speakers. I was struck a little bit that we heard about gaps from two of you, uh, from both Jasmine and Cynthia, one data ga gaps, uh, one infrastructure gaps, and then all three of you had presentations where it's humans, it's people who are filling in those gaps. Uh, for Jasmine, you're talking about crypto parties, Veronica passing legislation, and Cynthia collecting data. So um, really, really wonderful presentations. I wanted to ask initially if any of the panelists have questions for one another. And, and if not, that's okay. I have a couple questions for you. No. Okay, okay, fine. Um, so uh, just to start out uh, with Veronica, actually. So you talked about the introduction of some new technologies into the restaurant industry. You said that technology's been there for a long time, actually. And do you think that these technologies are necessarily bad? Uh, is automation inherently problematic? And also, more particularly, does it harm all workers equally, or do some workers win? Um, I would say that low-wage workers of color and immigrants and women are probably not uh, in a winning situation. But, but I, I will start by saying that I think inherently tech and automation isn't going to sort of at least in our sector, displace all people. I think one of the things that we know that we've seen is that what tech has done is magnify existing inequalities and workplace conditions and worker well-being is fundamentally about power. So who has the power to shape the economy and who has the power to shape the existing tech terrain? And so since for us, we know that the Restaurant Association is fiercely powerful. Uh, they have a tremendous lobby. They've managed to keep tip wages in place for over 130 years and federal there hasn't been an increase since 1991. Um, we've seen that they've normalized uh, a sub-minimum wage, and we've seen that that has uh, moved into different sectors. So for example, uh, if we focus on delivery workers, folks that delivery, deliver food through apps, um, we've seen that the penetration of a sub-minimum wage in its own way, right? There are tons of issues there around misclassification, but there's fundamentally um, a notion that an employer can divert its obligation. It could essentially outsource who has to pay the worker. And so apps like DoorDash, Seamless through Relay, et cetera, um, are taking the norms that the restaurant industry have established. They're taking sort of that power and they're creating another expectation that this new segment of workers are going to primarily depend on tips. They're going to race through bad weather to uh, chase a tip to make ends meet. And so that's you know one of the ways that we've seen it amplify existing inequalities, right? So workers of color are predominantly restaurant workers and they're also predominantly delivery workers. And so that we've seen that there's there's just a clear yeah, imbalance of power that we've seen really shape out. And actually, Taeyun was just telling me earlier about some uh, new technologies that are going to also be transnational potentially and uh, have um, robots delivering. Yeah, so when, one thing that's worth mentioning is that no other country in the world essentially has a tip wage. Um, and delivery workers, you know, in other parts of the world are also rising up. And so what we've seen that the industry has also managed to do is create a really disparate and disaggregate workforce. So re the restaurant industry isn't, this is also like just answering my own question, um, but the restaurant industry isn't unionized. And I think you really see that power imbalance. So it, it, it'll be interesting to see how that's regulated in other places that have been more worker friendly and where the restaurant industry hasn't had the same power to shape. Uh, what it means to be a worker. Thank you. Um, and Jasmine, I was one of the things I was struck about your talk was the the broad historical scope of your description of technology and of uh, this concept of people as infrastructure. And so that also resonated a little bit with uh, Veronica's talk because you also talked about technology being present in, in the restaurant industry for a long time. Do you have any sense of where the limits are on what you would describe as technology or people acting as infrastructure? Well, I think people as infrastructure is imperfect. Right? So people can fill in the gaps, but they're not the, what's supplied is not perhaps the most, the, the most efficient, perhaps not the most effective. Uh, so where people are filling in, it's great that they're doing it, but I think we still need government to move in certain ways on 
on, on the behalf of the people they're supposed to be representing. So if a failure, for example, is that, you know what, you are using a technology, for example, they just rolled out Omni, right, in New York City, where it's uh, the tap. It's the, the, the cashless, the contactless, I'm sorry, uh, technology for the metro, right? But a failure in that is, first of all, if everybody's gonna have to use it, that means everybody's gonna have to get a car, but it's a surveillance tool. I mean, can we, can we be honest? <laughs> it's a surveillance tool. And there are cameras attached to that system, and there is, if you look at the privacy policy, which I did for some reason, it says it collects other data as deemed appropriate and will share data as deemed, what does that mean? That's a failure because you are dealing with people's expectations and you're not actually telling them. So where people fill in is, I can tell you that this is what's gonna happen with Omni, but unless I can stop that from happening, my filling in as infrastructure is imperfect. So I can help you, I can try to reduce harm, I can tell you maybe you should still use cash or something like that. But it doesn't take away all of the harm for all of the people. And I think that's an important thing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Please uh, join me in thanking our speakers.